Mahaba. Welcome to Syria, an ancient country of culture located between the Mediterranean and the desert. Its ancient desert metropolises, old villages, impenetrable fortresses and biblical harbour towns have witnessed the rich and fascinating history of bygone times. Due to the incredible abundance of Occidental and Oriental cultures, this treasure trove of history continues to play a unique role in today's world. Damascus, capital of Syria and symbol of culture in the Near East. A paradise on earth. Almost a hundred kilometers from the Mediterranean coast, the strategically located Damascus was once the capital of the Umayyad. The large and splendid Qazir al-Azam palace dates back to the 18th century. Umayyad and Byzantine buildings once stood on this site. Azad al-Azam, the Ottoman governor, ordered the construction of this building. The materials for this building originated from the ruins of the distant Bosra. Cannons, busts of various presidents and military vehicles are displayed in the large courtyard of the Takeya Mosque, an ancient dervish monastery complex. Built in 1554 and designed by Ottoman master architect Sinan, it also includes an adjoining inn for the numerous pilgrims who travel to Mecca. The Kalar Citadel is situated on the periphery of the old town that was once surrounded by huge walls. It was from here that Sultan Saladin fended off the attacks of the Crusaders. Located directly outside the city wall, the river Barada was also of strategic importance. Although the Mongols destroyed the inner buildings, the fortress walls survived. Recent times have also seen much action here. Emir Faisal was made king here, but soon afterwards he was dethroned by the French who occupied the city. Since 1944, Damascus has been the capital of the Arabian Republic of Syria. Its population grows constantly and soon it will reach the 4 million mark. The Khan Asad Pasha is often referred to as being the most beautiful caravan sarai in the Near East. Its inner courtyard is covered by eight mighty and partly painted cupolas, each of which is supported by four pillars. The large main cupola no longer exists. The small and modest entrances in the narrow lanes draw little attention. No one would suspect the magnificent splendor of the city palaces and civic houses that lie beyond them. Bet Nizam is situated in the former district of the noblemen south of Straight Street. Bet Anbar is a striking building. Its owner was a Jewish merchant, Yusuf Anbar, but the Ottomans took it from him. Another restored palace is Bet Sibai. Again, it's difficult to perceive the splendor and beauty that lies hidden behind the gray walls. It's like something from the 1001 Nights. The souk is an important part of every Islamic city, a market that originated in ancient times. Thousands of shops in numerous interconnected lanes form the commercial heart of Damascus. This has been the Arab way since time immemorial. This trading metropolis has for thousands of years been a place desired by the powerful. High walls surround the most important sacred building in Islam, the Umayyad Mosque. 
built on the site of a Roman temple. In 708 AD, Caliph al-Walid ordered the construction of the huge complex and financed it with taxes collected in Syria. The large prayer hall within the mosque is covered with carpet, and this marble shrine is said to contain the head of John the Baptist. Bab Tuma is a picturesque district in the east of the old town that is mainly inhabited by Christians. Here there are numerous churches and monasteries of various Christian beliefs. Damascus is still the most beautiful capital city in the Near East. The journey south leads across the high Huran Plateau that has frequent rain and snowfalls to as far as Shaba, the place of birth of the soldier king Philippus Arabs. He became famous for the transformation of this native village into a splendid town that he sketched out on a drawing board. Roman architecture at its most pure. With an amphitheater, forum, palace complexes, huge thermal baths, and encircled by a city wall with four gates. Today, Shaba is mainly inhabited by Druze, a mysterious tribe that originated from the Yemen and traveled here with a Muslim army to Damascus. The nearby Kanawat contains the seat of the Druze leadership. Only a few ruins indicate the former importance of this ancient town. In Roman times, it was part of the Decapolis, an economic and political alliance of several Syrian towns. It was here that the interests of the Nabataeans and the Jews united until Kanawat fell to the Arabs. Amid the fertile Nukra plains in the south are the ruins of Bosra. The Nabataea Gate is a reminder of the first rulers of this thousand-year-old city. Here are many fine examples of Roman antiquity, as well as of early Christian Byzantine and Arab Islamic times. Even after Bosra was annexed to the Roman Empire, the influence of Nabataea continued. This ancient town became an influential center of political power. The Bahira Basilica is a legendary place. According to legend, it was here that the monk Sergius introduced the prophet Muhammad to Christianity and described to him his divine mission. The remains of a cathedral and a nearby bishop's palace are 700 years older than the Islamic ruins and date back to the early 6th century. The 15th century Mameluk Baths of Hammam Manjak are one of the most beautiful ruins here. And the Alu Mari Mosque was completely constructed from ancient building materials. Basra owed its swift success as a flourishing metropolis mainly to the Romans. Architectural and historic examples of the Roman Empire, such as the Southern Thermos, still cover large areas of the ancient city and highlight the former splendor of this town. A 
900-meter-long street was once the main axis of the city that, at its zenith, had around 80,000 inhabitants. Today, around a thousand people live here. The city's main tourist attraction, a Roman amphitheatre, was transformed into a fortified citadel while under Islamic rule. The site of the huge Roman amphitheatre could hardly be more spectacular. It could once seat 20,000. Here, the former wealth of the capital of the Roman province is particularly impressive. The amphitheater became both a symbol and a landmark of ancient Bosra. A unique combination of numerous historic and cultural epochs. Thirty kilometers north of Damascus is the village of Sednaya. It has a place of interest that is situated on a hill, a huge Greek Orthodox nunnery. Throughout the year, it is a pilgrimage destination. It was built on Byzantine foundations and despite its many recent additions, it still looks like a fortress. Around 30 nuns live here. This nunnery is the oldest in the world that has been constantly inhabited. According to legend, Emperor Justinian, who was hunting in this area, saw a gazelle that was transformed into a glorious vision of the Holy Virgin Mary. A place of miracles and faith, where both Christians and Muslims are united in prayer, and where peace is constantly prayed for. Even at the time of the Crusades, the nunnery was a place of pilgrimage. A Maria icon that is thought to have been created by the evangelist Lucas is on display in a small chapel next to the main church. This legendary icon has been worshipped since the time of the Crusades. It's believed to have miraculous powers and Arab Christians as well as Muslim pilgrims travel here to pray. A few kilometers north on the edge of a high plateau is the Ma'alula Valley, a hidden paradise. Syria's most famous and most beautiful village is located at the foot of rock walls. The walls are perforated with caves and the dwellings stick like swallows nests to the rock. On the 1700 meter high mountain crest above the village is the Marsakis Monastery. It can only be entered through a small gate in a wall. Its ancient chapel is believed to be one of the oldest Christian churches. A deep gorge leads down to the valley. It ends at the holy Tekla Monastery. This is where al Fajj originated when Tekla escaped from her father's henchmen. The Greek Orthodox Ma Tekla Monastery lies on a steep slope. It was built on the site where Tekla once lived and prayed for her escape. The Apostle Paulus converted her to Christianity and was saved by a miracle. Tekla then dedicated her life to the healing of the sick and soon she was worshipped.
The small chapel and cave directly on the rock wall above contain the tomb of Holy Tekla. She died here peacefully at the end of the first century AD. Today, Muslim as well as Christian pilgrims visit this holy place. Set amid the desert savanna of Syria are the proud remains of a unique and mysterious metropolis, Palmyra. The legendary ancient city was built in this area due to the existence of an oasis, Tadmur. The entrance to the ancient oasis city is a monumental triumphal arch, Hadrian's Gate. It dates back to Roman times. The Romans did much to influence Palmyra's architecture. The shortest and fastest route from the Mediterranean to Mesopotamia and Persia travels directly past the Tadmur oasis. So it was only a question of time until an important trading post was founded here. Later, a flourishing cultural and economic center developed. This amphitheater dates back to the second century AD. Along with the market square, the Agora, it was the center of public life. Four thousand years ago, trade was important to Palmyra. The city was first mentioned in 1950 BC on one of the famous ancient Assyrian clay boards of Kultipe. At that time, donkey caravans traveled through the arid desert savanna. The Tadmor oasis was a welcome resting place that was also vital for the survival of the region's merchants. An increasing number of people gradually settled here. During the Hellenistic period, this modest settlement grew into a full-blown city and Tadmor became Palmyra. The wealth of Palmyra's inhabitants is highlighted by their necropolises such as those in the Valley of Graves. The tomb towers here have the typical architectural design of the old necropolises of Palmyra, but little is known of their cultural background and original construction. Subterranean burial places have also been found here. At the beginning of the rule of Emperor Tiberius in the first century AD, the trading metropolis was given a new name, City of Palm Trees. At the southeastern edge of ancient Palmyra is one of the main attractions of the legendary desert city, the Baal Temple. The main god of this oasis city was worshipped here since the 3rd century BC. There is a marvellous fairy tale like building two kilometres northwest of the oasis on a steep rock above the ruins of the ancient city the Arabian castle of Kalat ibn Man. Each of the historic monuments is an ancient reminder of a fascinating and mysterious epoch of desert history. Around 250,000 Bedouins live in Syria's desert areas. They are nomads who speak Arabic and belong to the Muslim faith. Their income is derived from sheep, goats and camels, which produce both milk and meat. They travel the desert accompanied by their animals. 
They're constantly on the move and graze their animals at every opportunity. They move from one location to another depending upon the time of year. They live in close-knit families that would help them to survive in the remoteness of the desert where the lack of water, the scorching heat and demanding terrain make life extremely difficult. However, the modern life is also evident here. And a tractor and a small portable stove make daily life a little easier. Although the Bedouins are losing more and more of their freedom and independence, their pride, honor and hospitality are still intact. Almost like a Fata Morgana, these buildings that date back to the time of Justinian suddenly appear in the endless savanna. Kazir ibn Wadan, palace and church. Even today, the various colors of the building materials give these structures a striking appearance. Decorated cupolas that in Syria are few and far between, as well as the symbols and decorations above the church gate and the windows indicate the high status of these buildings. This was once an important administrative and military center, situated on the north border of the Byzantine realm. It had both a military and governmental function. Red shining bricks and yellow sandstone are in stark contrast to dark basalt. The ceiling vaults were once supported by posts and columns. Upstairs are the fascinating rooms of the governor. From here he had a fine view of the surrounding landscape and military camp whose remains have been discovered next to the palace. Our journey takes us further into the isolated landscape. Again and again, abandoned and decaying beehive huts appear beside the road. These traditional Syrian huts are constructed of mud bricks and consist of a single room that is crowned by a high cupola. They're regularly plastered with mud, hence their circular form. Suddenly, a number of beehive huts appear. They serve as houses for poultry and as storage rooms. They're no longer used for human habitation. Today, the villagers live in huts with flat roofs. Along with several beehive huts, they form a small farm that is surrounded by a brick wall. The construction is extremely practical. Warm air collects in the cupola and the mud acts as a regulator between the heat of the day and the cool of the night. However, in the 1950s, the beehive huts that served as dwelling places for several centuries were banned for human habitation. On our journey to the Mediterranean coast, close to the Lebanese border, we travel past some of the most beautiful and most well-preserved crusader castles in the Orient. Crac de Chevalier. Each of the crusaders' buildings and fortresses have their own atmosphere and history, but this fortress became a unique symbol for an entire epoch.
These buildings are a magnificent sight, and it's easy to forget the terrible things that happened here. The despair of war, greed, and religious fanaticism. The huge fortress contains several corridors. Its upper floors could accommodate 1,500 soldiers and up to 400 knights and their horses. The crack was of novel construction. A huge bastion was built in the center of the complex, a fortress within a fortress. And this was essential because the fortress was a Christian stronghold set within a Muslim land. The knights could only depend upon themselves. The Orms Gate is majestically guarded by the Crac de Chevalier. The castle is situated 755 meters above the fortress on a hill. From here is a splendid view of the coast. Who were the Crusaders? In 1095, Pope Urban II fanatically proclaimed to free the grave of the Lord from the heathen masses. Flemish, Southern French and Northern Knights took up the quest. First, disagreement among the Muslims, as well as their surprise at the appearance of the infidel, made it possible for the Christians to conquer many regions. Fortresses such as this were built. However, the Muslims were led by Saladin and soon they began to fight back. This fortress withstood no less than 11 sieges. Eventually, the courageous knights surrendered and were allowed to retreat to the coast unharmed. Next, we arrive at Tartus, a harbour town on the Mediterranean that was founded by the Phoenicians. Situated only 60 kilometers north of the Lebanese harbour town of Tripoli, Tartus was very important in Crusader times. A wide corniche separates the water from the houses that are situated close to the water's edge. And a narrow sandy beach is ideal for bathing. The harbour played an important role during the Lebanese Civil War of 1975, but today it is less significant. In 1282, Sultan Kulawan presented the city of Tortosa to the Knights Templars for their perpetual ownership. Shortly after this, the Knights built the Cathedrale Notre Dame. The complex of the former citadel is now hardly recognizable. It's been replaced by the old town that we see today. The citadel made it possible to control the entire coastal region, but when Saladin attacked, the knights were only able to defend a small part of the complex. In 1291, they escaped through a subterranean tunnel to their boats and a nearby island. Thus, the Crusaders lost Tartus. Close to Tartus is an ancient Phoenician place of culture, the Spring Sanctuary of Amrit, that dates back to the 6th and 5th centuries BC. 
A huge water basin was cut into the limestone rock that is surrounded by a row of pillars. The divine water that was vital for survival was directed via canals and gargoyles into the basin. Here, plants and blossoms were sacrificed. In the middle of the basin is a small building that is open on its western side. It once contained the statue of the deity Melkart. Each of the 10 meter high tomb towers are reminiscent of the nearby necropolis. The dead were buried in subterranean rock chambers. The Phoenicians believed that the dead lived on as shadows in the afterlife. The places of rest were unimpeachable and protected by lion symbols. Hama existed 7,000 years ago, a city of water wheels that are constantly noisy both day and night. The city is located on both sides of the river Orontes. Even today, the picturesque water wheels supply water to the nearby savanna and transform it into fertile farmland. The huge wooden bucket wheels that create the load rattling noise are called Norias. For centuries, they've powered water from the river to the city's gardens and fields. The city relies upon its water supply. Canals, aqueducts and more than a dozen water wheels have made their mark on the city and are its main landmarks. Unfortunately, a number of the Nureyes were destroyed during a fundamentalist Muslim revolt. Where once a medieval citadel dominated the fortified mountain, there's now a park, and the views of the city are quite breathtaking. Following the high season of the Asuras, the original Hamat was conquered and destroyed. The city eventually fell under new Babylonian, Archimenidean and finally following the death of Alexander, Seleucidian rule. In Roman and Byzantine times and also following the defeat of the Arabs, Hama was a wealthy city, a fact highlighted by its few remaining buildings. The Christian Crusaders were unable to conquer La Chamelle, as they called Hama. The city therefore has no European influences. Further north, on the edge of the fertile al Ditch, is the ancient metropolis of Apamea, one of the most beautiful cities in the Near East. Apart from Bosra and Palmyra, this huge city of ruins is one of the most important Hellenist regions in Syria. Seleucos I, founder of Dura Europus, named Apamea after his Persian wife. The king kept 500 war elephants here. He also had a stud farm with 30,000 mares and 300 stallions. The national treasury was also stored here.
but few buildings have survived. These ruins mainly date back to Roman times. At that time, 117,000 free men lived in Upper Mare and the surrounding area. The total population was around 500,000. In the 4th century, an archbishop had his seat here, and also a cathedral. The bishop led a theological war against Byzantes. Following a devastating earthquake, the Roman Emperor Trajan raised this area to the ground and had the city rebuilt according to his own design. A two kilometer long colonnade led through the city that was protected by a sturdy wall. During the chaotic rule of the soldier emperors in Rome, Saturnius dared to declare Apamea an independent city, but for this he had to pay with his life. The city expanded and many property owners flourished, but then followed a number of wars, until the Sassanidian monarch Chosro conquered the city. The city's 292,000 inhabitants were taken prisoner. The cities of the dead were situated in the north of the country, and a number of their stone structures have survived. Siagila is one of the most impressive. Due to its location in a valley, its fine state of repair, and also because of its ghostly atmosphere. Various settlements originated here in the 5th century. The buildings were constructed of large reddish stone. There were villas, a meeting hall, a church, and a necropolis. In addition to olives and wheat, vines were also cultivated here. Business flourished and the local produce was even praised in distant Rome. Albara was also successful and developed into a, a boom town. Its wealthy inhabitants had huge tombs built, but today these monuments are quite difficult to locate in this sprawling city. There were also five churches and three monasteries in this city that was under the jurisdiction of Constantinople until the Crusaders arrived here. They murdered and pillaged and had a new bishop installed. Next they travelled to Jerusalem and only seven knights and thirty soldiers remained. al Katora is one of the dead cities, located on a hill. Cows graze peacefully between the stone ruins. Vines and olives were once grown here. Now there is little left of the former city. The architecture of these buildings is quite unusual. The supporting pillars can be seen clearly. The space between them was filled with large stones. Building materials came from the local area.
In the third millennium BC, the West Semite Ammonites founded the city of Ebla in a location that was ideal as a trading center between Hama and Aleppo. A 30 meter wide and 20 meter high mound is all that remains of the old town wall in a city that had a population of 30,000. A large and prosperous autonomous city originated here. Its influence reached far and wide and its inhabitants spoke their own language, one not spoken today. Ebla lay at the junction of two trading routes. Here came metal from Anatolia, precious wood from the Lebanon and gems from Persia. The Acropolis was once surrounded by the King's Palace, the Royal Archives and various temples. Each building was constructed of bricks. Archaeologists discovered a palace archive that contained 17,000 tablets of text. But it was in a Semite language that was unknown. Laborious efforts to translate the text resulted in identifying this city whose existence was known from other records but whose location was previously unknown. At the northern edge of the Katura Plains are the ruins of Kalat Saman, the most beautiful and largest pilgrimage destination of early Christian times in the Near East. The Simeon's Monastery was donated by Emperor Zeno. It is the greatest monument of Christian architecture modeled on the medieval cathedrals of Europe. Decorated stone columns and circular arches once supported the cupolas of the four basilicas that were built around a courtyard. The roof of the central church collapsed during an earthquake. The entire complex that also includes a monastery and a baptistry impresses by way of its modest yet harmonious forms. It's a place of silence and contemplation. A young monk, Simeon, is said to have stood here for 40 years upon a column in order to worship his god. A basilica was built above this column. In subsequent centuries, many ascetics of the Byzantine realm attempted to follow his example of column-standing worship and praise of God. The Byzantines took the remains of Simeon to Antioch and later, at the command of the emperor, to Istanbul. This was the view experienced by Holy Simeon. We next visit Aleppo in the north of Syria, a city that has always stood in the shadow of Damascus, although its history is at least as long. Aleppo is more oriental than Damascus, and its traders are far smarter. Music 
In this city that was once an important trading center, its caravanserais and trading houses played an important role, as did its warehouses and living areas. Up until the 19th century, the various khans also contained branches of European banks and trading companies as well as the consuls of their associated countries. There were stables too. Here, the horses worked long and hard. Being at the junction of important trading routes for hundreds of years, Aleppo controlled the transport routes through Syria. The Omeyaden Mosque is said to have been as glamorous as its counterpart at Damascus. Recently, restoration work has begun. In 1169, it was destroyed by fire. Only its 45-meter-high minaret survived. Nuradin ordered it to be rebuilt. The city's many Quran schools teach the writings of Islam, the laws of behavior, and the ethnic doctrines of the prophets. Inscriptions at the entrance of the former hospital curse those who show it no respect. Today, an age-old tradition is to be found here. Whirling dervishes. Here, music and dance play an important role and express mainly grief, pain and longing. Aleppo is as ancient as eternity, like something from the 1001 Nights. Betz, the name of the noble dwellings and city palaces of the rich, splendid doors, living areas and inner courtyards hidden within modest walls. In the warm months, family life takes place in the courtyard and in addition to the traditional women's quarters, some of the houses have a bathing house. The abundant Baroque ornaments and European metal lamps indicate the wealth of the Ottoman family that once owned this property. In the 13th century, its close relationship with Venice gave Aleppo a leading role in European-Asian trade. Under Ottoman rule, the trading companies and their mainly Christian and Jewish agents were treated like diplomats and thus enjoyed many related benefits. But despite this and the high profits that were possible, the city had a bad reputation among foreigners. Each foreigner had to live in the khan that was assigned to him. An artificial water ditch surrounds the citadel. The mightiest Muslim fortified building in Syria was built on a 50 meter high rocky plateau. In Damascus, it was the oasis that attracted settlers. But here, it was the citadel's mountain. For more than 2,000 years, the citadel had a monarchy. The fascinating view across this grey city is still to be seen today. This 10,000-year-old land has always stood between the strained relations of East and West where people and countries were at loggerheads. At the junction of ancient caravan routes and in the center of the fertile half moon where the earliest civilizations of mankind have developed.
Syria is the pearl of the East. With deserts, wadis and mountains, Arabian castles and crusader fortresses, Roman ruins, palaces and mosques. A legendary country between both past and future, whose cultural treasures still survive today.